Well, good morning. Happy Mother's Day to all of you. Uh, for the mothers in the room, I just want to say thank you for what you do, for the families, for the community, for your children. Hope you feel honored this morning. And of course, uh, for many, uh, Mother's Day is actually not a day maybe of celebration. Maybe it's a day of pain and hurt. Uh, maybe you are struggling with uh, infertility. Uh, maybe you've lost a child. Maybe you've lost a parent. Maybe you have a broken relationship with your mom. Um, and so I just want to say thank you for being here. Thank you for the courage of showing up on a day that uh, might feel particularly difficult for you, and I, uh, my prayer is that you would feel loved and cared for uh, with us this morning. Uh, today, we are finishing our series, What Would Jesus Undo? You remember the popular What Would Jesus Do? bracelets? Uh, in this series, we are looking at what are the things that Jesus was around today, what are the ways that he might confront us, those of us that are followers of Jesus, oh, in the areas of our lives if we're not careful. And so we've talked about political idolatry, politics matters, it has real implications on our lives, but if we're not careful, we can idolize them in a way that are not helpful. Uh, we've talked about hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is not the fact that we're sinners and we're falling short. Hypocrisy is when we act like we actually have it all together. Last week, we talked about hollow worship, uh, where we go through the motions, but our hearts are actually far from God. And today, we're going to be talking about spiritual pride. And so to get us all on the same kind of terms of what that actually means, here's the definition. It's on your screen. Spiritual pride is finding your value and worth in what you do for God rather than what God has done for you. So if you're a follower of Jesus this morning, a spiritual pride, what would Jesus undo or he challenge or confront us? It's the places in our life where we fall, find our value and our worth in uh, what we do for God rather than what God has done for us. Uh, Jesus actually confronted uh, the religious leaders and the followers of God in the day with that very thing. And so we'll pick, read one of those stories. If you have a Bible, uh, go ahead and open up to Mar uh, Luke, sorry, chapter 18. Luke 18, if you don't have a Bible, there's a black one around you, and you can take one of those black ones home if you do not own a Bible. It is our gift to you. Uh, Luke chapter 18, Jesus is talking to a crowd. He has some religious leaders and some people who had gathered around, and he had been teaching through some parables, and now he's going to give another one. And here's what it says, Luke 18, starting in verse 9. He, all, he also, this is Jesus here, told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. So you know off the bat that Jesus is going to get somebody here, and you're like reading this like, let's go, Jesus, let's do this. Right? They trusted in themselves, so what happened? They looked down on others. Whenever you and I do this, whenever we trust in ourselves and our awesomeness and what we have done, it easily allows us to look down on other people. And so Jesus is addressing those and us when we're not careful about the places we, where we are quick to rely on ourselves. And we do this in a lot of ways, right? So let me give you uh, some examples, right? Politics, right? Tell me if you've ever seen this exchange online. Someone has a political preference and idea. They comment and someone responds by saying, listen, you made some amazing points. Here are some reasons why I disagree. Here's kind of my position. And here's why I'm there. And, and I love what you're saying here, but consider this. And then that person, the original poster, responds by saying, man, that is awesome. Like, I didn't think about some of those things. Thank you. Like, that is, I'm going to think about that. Now, now, here's what I would say off the top of my mind. Like, here's what I would think. And the person responds by saying, you know, that's really good. I, I love what you're saying. That, like, that doesn't happen. What does it happen? You're dumb. No, you're dumb. No, you're dumb. That's what we do. See, what happens is we often don't just disagree politically. We look down on those who think differently than us, right? We could do this with parenting, right? You, we've all know, you know, the, some, you know, out of the store, some mom or some dad's got some little kid who's going crazy, and we're like, okay, I get it. Sometimes kids go crazy in the store, nothing to do about it, but what do you think? Well, I wouldn't respond like that. I can't believe she's doing that. She's just giving in and giving him candy? Uh-uh. That boy needs to get spanked. I don't know if you can say that. I don't know. But right, right, so what happens is we don't just disagree with, with, with what's going on. We, we actually look down at others who do things differently than us. Maybe decisions people make. We, not, we might not just disagree. But we say, I can't believe they think that. We look down on others when we trust in ourselves and our judgment. And here's what Jesus is confronting. And so verse 10, it says this. Two men went up to the temple. So this is a, a story that would have taken place in Jerusalem. They're going into the temple or going to the temple to pray. One is a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. Now, what, what I want to do here is I want to kind of get us in the mindset of how this actually would think to the first century Jewish audience, right? Automatically, in our 21st century mindset, we know what side we're on. Pharisees are bad, right? They're judgmental. They're hypocritical. Don't like those. The tax collector is the, is the reject, is the one who people don't like. And so we're automatically like, man, I hope the tax collector wins. 
Uh, this is not how they would have saw this story coming. So in a first century setting, a Pharisee is someone who is actually extremely respected. Right? If you were a Jewish person, you would think, man, I wish I could be like them. A Pharisee could read. It's estimated that maybe roughly around 10% of the Roman Empire in the first century could actually read. Uh, you would wear certain things out in public that would, sh- that would give you status. I mean, they were someone that you actually liked and wished that you could be like. On the other hand, a tax collector, again, is someone that you didn't like. If you were a Jewish person, uh, undoubtedly in your life, you would have a family member or a friend who was probably killed or beaten or imprisoned unjustly, but there's nothing you can do about it. And so imagine right, a living, growing up in this Roman oppression where you were uh, maligned and mistreated and looked down upon, and then one of your really good friends who you grow up with decides not just to be like an IRS tax collector today, which we like maybe don't like them, we wish they wouldn't take so much money. Uh, this is somebody who's not only taxing you to... Uh, Uh, to uh, continue the Roman oppression, but they're getting rich off of you. They've betrayed you. They are the worst of the worst. And so there's not really a a modern equivalent of these two things, but I did my best just to try to get us into the mindset of what's happening here. Uh, Pharisee would have been respected. So uh, someone who kind of like we all respect in our culture today is a scientist, right? Follow the science, trust the science. And I'm not knocking that, but all of us could agree that today it seems that a PhD in whatever science you have, like that is someone that we all like. Right, and so this is how you could you would view this as a first century Jew. You have a scientist who are like, "That's good. I wish I knew what they did. I wish I could do what they did." And then you would have, let's say, maybe maybe someone who smuggles drugs. And I'm not just talking about like some weed or some dope. I'm talking about like hard narcot- narcotics here, like crack cocaine, right? That we would all say, yeah, that's bad. And in fact, the people who do that would probably admit, yeah, it's not that great. Uh, they're profiting off of people being oppressed and people being addicted. They're getting rich by destroying people's lives. And so that's maybe better of a mindset of what's happening here. You have a scientist who we all respect and a drug smuggler who would all say, yeah, they're the worst of the worst. We don't like them. And they both decide to go and pray. And here's what happens. Verse 11. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like the other people, greedy, unrighteous, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of everything I get. Now, immediately we read this, and we know this is not going to go well for the Pharisee, talking about all these things that he has done. But here's the reality. What the Pharisee is saying is true. Right? What he is saying is true, and it's actually good that he does it. I mean, again, being a Pharisee was highly respected. You would give, peop- to, you would, give, you would uh, do things. Uh, again, you can read. Most people couldn't. Uh, the Phar- most Pharisees, if they were in rabbinical school, becoming to training to become a Pharisee, uh, would, you would have uh, if most of, if not all of the Pentateuch, which is the first five books of the Bible, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, memorized. Right? Memorize. And in fact, by the time you were about 30 years old and began your kind of Pharisee, your religious training or your religious ministry, uh, you might have the entire Old Testament memorized. Um, you would know that not a, like a Bible trivia question is how many Old Testament laws are there? 613. You wouldn't just know that there were 613. You actually would know all of them, like what they were. They were respected in a culture that valued uh, authority. Unlike our culture today, you had authority. and a culture that valued like oratorial skill and speaking in public, you would do this all the time time, you wish that you could be a Pharisee. He does all of these things. And by, in terms of like what he's done, does for God, he does things that maybe other people didn't do. So what's the problem? The problem here is that the Pharisee is talking about all the things that he has done for God rather than what God has done for him. What he's saying is true, but it's all about I, I, I. Look what I have done for you. And so you should bless me and you should respect me. And again, all of us can do this when we are not careful. Let me give you maybe some modern examples of ways that we do this. Right? Me might think, for example, uh, God, instead of thank, thank you, God, for allowing to me to be a part of a church that's following Jesus and that is encouraging me and is doing cool things in the community, if we're not careful, what can we sometimes think or say to God? Instead of saying, God, thank you for my church, we might say, God, you're welcome that I came to church today at all. I'm tired, had a long week. It's Mother's Day, the weather's getting nice. God, you're just, wel- you're, thank- you're welcome, the fact that I showed up, right? Or when it comes to your kids, right? Let me just say this. As someone who doesn't like kids, kids are awesome, right? You should have them, right? They're great, right? Unless your kids are at New City, then I like your kids as well, right? But I don't, I'm not a kid person, but I love my kids, and they're great. But what happens, right? Instead of thanking God for our kids, even when life can be hard and difficult, what do we think? What do we say? We can say to God, well, God, you're welcome for teaching them how to behave and be productive members of society, right? Look what I have done for you. 
Or God, instead of saying thank you for my spouse, again, it's another thing that our culture knocks. I would commend it to you. I am glad that I'm married to Christina. I would much rather be married than not married. But instead of thanking God for our spouse, if you're married, what can you do? You could say, God, uh, you're welcome for trying to be a good husband or wife. You're welcome that I'm not like that person. Do you see how they speak to their wife? I don't do that. I may not be the best, but I'm not like them. God, you're welcome for what I do. Or how about this one? Right? Instead of, God, thank you for the job or the resources you've provided me. Maybe I don't love my job, but I have a place to live. I have food on my table. Instead of God saying, God, thank you for that, we can say, God, you're welcome for the 2% I give back to everything that you've given to me. One, one more? Is this fun? Okay, I'll do one more. This is fun for me. God, instead of thank you for the friends and the community that you have surrounded me with, the people that love and care about me, we can say, God, you're welcome for forgiving that person that hurt me. God, you're welcome for giving them a second chance when I shouldn't have done that. See, we all can be prideful. In other words, here's what we need to see in this text, that spiritual pride is a religious, or sorry, isn't a religious person problem. Spiritual pride is not a religious person problem, right? It's a, it's, it's a problem that we all deal with, and we can kind of view the Pharisees and be like, well, I'm glad I'm not like that religious person. The reality is we all can struggle with this if we are not careful, and in fact, it would be prideful to assume that this is not an issue for you or for me. What we do is we compare ourselves to others to make ourselves feel better when, in fact, we're actually being prideful. So we may say things like, well, I'm not racist because this person is worse than I am. Or I'm not a bad person because I know a list of people who do worse than I am. And we look at ourselves and try to build ourselves up. I like to think of a story of an example of this, of being prideful and assuming you are not. Was I, when I was in high school, it was a Wednesday night, and we, I was driving back. My friends and uh, my little brother, who was five years younger than me at the time, uh, still five years younger than me. So <laughs> it's crazy how life works. So he was in middle school. And, uh, and I was in high school, and so it was like a youth group thing. We're driving back, and, you know, he should be grateful that I drove him back. I mean, his mom and dad didn't pick him up. He gets to drive home with his brother who's in high school. Like, that's some cool points, right? I mean, it should be. So we're driving home, and I was, you know, taking two of my friends to drop them off. We get home, and I don't remember what happened, but basically my little brother snitched on me. He told my parents that apparently something about my driving he didn't like and that I wasn't paying attention. And I will have you know that even to this day, I have a perfect driving record, right? <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Again, it's my pride trying to tell you how great I am, right? right? But, and I got in trouble. And I was like, boy, I brought you to and from church. You didn't have to drive with your parents, and this is how you were paying me. So I get in trouble, and what is the first thing I say to my parents? Well, my older brother, who is, I don't know, about 18 months older than me, still is to this day. Um, <laughs> Well, the first thing I said to them was, well, he listens to really loud, like, punk rock music that you can't even hear anything with it, right? Like, it's like, oh, right? I wish Brian was up here. He would scream it for you. Um, I asked, by the way, Brian, who's on staff here, he's a screamo person, and I asked him if he screams in the car to music. Like, is that something you do? Apparently it is, so I don't know. Right, but what I immediately, I try to justify myself by saying, well, I don't do what he does, so I should not be in trouble. See, here's what we see happening here, that the Pharisees didn't have issues with religious pride because they were Pharisees. It's not like everyone's fine, and if you become a religious, if you become a Pharisee or religious leader, then all of a sudden you magically become prideful. Now, here's the reality, that spiritual pride is a human problem. It is not something that only the elite or certain few people or certainly not us, but other people deal with. It is a human problem that we all can deal with if we are not careful. Uh, in fact, let me give you another story from high school to show how this, how this works. Uh, before I got a car, before I was driving, I would have, you know, various things after, high, you know, after school as a freshman and a sophomore, and so there'd be times where my parents would have to uh, pick me up. And uh, I would be, I would, I mean, I was a really good prayer warrior when that happened. And it's not because, well, I was just a really good prayer warrior. It's because the days that I knew that my dad was picking me up, I would pray, A, that my, it was my mom, and if it was my dad, that he would take my mom's car. The reason why is because I went to uh, a really affluent high school, a lot of really big houses and a lot of houses near the high school. It's kind of like I grew up in Cary, and so it was like all the rich people who didn't send their kids to, pu- to private school. This is where they send their kids. And so uh, my dad would drive a car that was maybe uh, not even up to par to all the other high school students. He drove a 1992 Oldsmobile Cutlass. Uh, here's a picture of it. Now, here's the thing. Thank you. Right? This is what I was like. God, please. Right? Or there would be nobody there. Right? Have nobody be outside when I step into this thing. Now, here's the thing. At the time, I don't know, it's like 15, 16 year old car. And uh, there are some cars that are older, that are older, and, um, but it's like not that big of a deal. Like a Honda Civic that's kind of older. It's like, eh. This thing 
It's old. And I don't know how car stuff works, and you guys know this, so I'm not going to try to explain it. But it's one of those things where it was a V6, so this thing would go. It was long, and it would go downhill. And most cars, when you go downhill, they speed up a little bit, but there's something from, to stop them from, like, going super fast. Well, whatever that is, this car didn't have. I mean, you'd go downhill, and you'd be, like, 45 to 90 in, like, three seconds. I mean, this thing was just, it had, the, it had no CD player. It had the rolling windows. It was embarrassing. But so I prayed really, really well, really, really hard when I knew he was coming to pick me up, that nobody would see this car or that uh, he would take my mom's car. Now, what, here's what happened. To show us, to demonstrate that spiritual pride is a human problem, and then I eventually got a car of my own. It was a 1998 Honda Civic, which, you know, was fine, a little black, you know, five-speed, and it was awesome, at least compared to my dad's car. And all of a sudden, my prayer life changed. And nothing about me changed. It was just my inner emotion led to a different action. No longer was I embarrassed, right? No longer was I kind of like, please, nobody see me get into this car. What happened is my situation changed. And so uh, even though I could be prideful, my situation changed. And so I didn't no longer had this idea of trying to impress other people because I was no longer embarrassed. Maybe to put it this way, I think what happens is when we read texts like this and we say, well, listen, I know I don't have it all together, but I'm not like that Pharisee. But here's the reality of the situation for many of us and what this illustration of my car shows us, that spiritual pride often comes from insecurity and not arrogance. Our pride often comes from insecurity, not arrogance. Here, here's what I uh, mean. Uh, most of us don't think we're like some awesome, amazing person. Like to some degree we all do, but most of us would not go around what, like this Pharisee did in front of other people and talk about how great we are. That's not what we do. It's not what our culture is about. And so what happens is instead of doing that, we will downplay others to make ourselves feel better. So we're prideful in that way. Instead of saying how awesome we are, we talk about how not awesome everyone else and elevate ourselves. So again, right, you might not be the most fashionable person in the world, but you say you look at someone who's wearing something that you would not wear and say, well, at least I don't wear that, right? Right? Or you've got your kids, again, out at, you know, grocery shop or whatever, and it's like, well, at least I don't respond to my kids like that, right? At least I don't drive that car. I may not be the best person, but at least I don't treat people like that. What we do is we downplay others to make ourselves feel better, meanwhile, completely forgetting the good news of the gospel, that it is not about what you have done, but what God has done for you. And so that we no longer have to live this life of trying to compare ourselves to others to make ourselves feel better, but knowing that in God's grace and his love and his mercy towards us, he did, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. That's why here at New City, we say if you're a follower of Jesus, you have nothing to prove and no one to impress. You don't have to play this game of downplaying others because Jesus has done all of it on your behalf for you, not because you're awesome, but simply because he loves you and he cares for you, right? You look at the gospel and this fights against the pride that you and I feel like we have to have. We talk about how great we are compared to other people. We don't have to do that because God says, I love you right where you are, and I want to change your life. It's not about what you have done. It's about what God has done for you. And the problem we see in this text is this Pharisee is talking about, look at all the things that I have done for you, completely forgetting about the goodness of God in his life. And so here's what the tax collector says, right? The bad person, right? The, the drug smuggler, the person that we would not like, we would all agree is a bad person today. Here's what the tax collector does. In verse 13 of Luke chapter 18, it says this. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. You see, here's what's happening with the tax collector. He knew where he stood. In fact, even going to the temple, he was extremely restricted and limited about where he was allowed to go. In fact, I don't know if any of you have seen the show The Chosen. Anyone seen The Chosen? Okay, that's it. okay, yeah. So if you haven't seen, I promise you it's better than that, than that little like, yeah, it's awesome, right? <laughs> if, all right, it's awesome. You can go on YouTube or you can download the app and you can put on your TV. It's a series about the life of Jesus and his disciples. They're in the second season right now. It's just, it's powerful. You get the backstory. I mean, of course, we don't actually know, but they give backstories to the disciples and just make the whole thing a lot more realistic. It's the chosen. I'd commend it to you. Uh, but one, is one of the interesting things is in the, for the first season, you, Jesus is calling some of his disciples and you have Matthew, the tax collector. And and they show this really well. What happens is, although he was wealthy and rich, he was isolated. And in fact, they have a scene where he, every morning he pays this guy with like a, uh, who like pulls this cart to hide him in his cart to bring him to uh, the place where he would take taxes because if he was out in public by himself, he would be bitten, beaten and spit at and mocked. And in fact, there's a scene where he does that, where he has to go somewhere on his own and he's spit on and he's like hit in the face. Like this is the life of a tax collector. Like they knew that nobody liked them, right? And so he feels nervous. 
uh, he feels out of place, and he clearly, at least to him, it's apparent that he is undeserved, undeserving of God's grace. And so what he says is in a stark contrast to what the Pharisee says, right? The Pharisee makes a claim to righteousness based off of his own merits and what he has done. The tax collector, on the other hand, relies entirely on the grace and mercy of God. Right, the grace and mercy of God. And so the responses are completely different. Uh, I see this happening in my own life of areas where I am a lot more humble and areas where I rely on my own you know, knowledge or perceived expertise. So for example, I've shared recently, uh, recently I've got into woodworking, which is a great time to do because uh, lumber is like triple the price of what it normally is. And so it's on a pastor's salary, it's just awesome. I did that. Um, but I used a little of that STEMI check, you know what I'm saying, to get me some tools. And uh, so I'm in the game and I've committed and I'm doing it. But here's the thing, I don't know anything about it, nothing. So I'm like watching these YouTube videos. I bought this online course that teaches you how to make some stuff. And I'll like ask people if I figure out they have tools and know what to do. Like I, there's no pride in me. I don't know what I'm doing. I'll ask all the questions in the world because I know where I stand, that I don't know what I'm doing. But if you contrast that to other areas in my life where I feel like I know what I'm doing and I can become prideful. So, uh, for example, an area that's relevant to us, uh, as I write sermons, part of the process is I will talk through my sermon with the staff uh, to get their feedback, to see if points make sense, to get stories or whatever. And so we do this every week. I talk through uh, an upcoming sermon. And there are times where I think to myself, as I'm getting feedback or getting correction, and I'll think to myself, you know what, why should I listen to you? <laughs> right, but for real, I'm like, I went to school for this. I got my master's degree in this. I do this every week. Who are you to tell me that this doesn't sound good, right? What do we do? I become prideful because I feel like I know everything and completely dismissing the backgrounds and the understanding and the perspectives of other people. I can become prideful in the areas where I feel like I've earned it, where I feel like I actually know what I am doing. And here's what I want to see happening from this text. When we do that, when we become prideful in ourselves, instead of seeing the grace and mercy of what God has done for us, here's what happens. That when we're full of ourselves, there's no room for God. When you are full of yourself and all that you have done, when I am full of myself and what I have done, there is no room for God. And what we see happening here is that Jesus gives us a better way. That you don't even have to pretend. That you don't even have to go up to the temple or go to church or go to the God in prayer and say, God, look what all of these things that I've done. So you please accept me. That's not what he said. He said, I love you right where you are, and I want to change your life. When we are full of ourselves and what we have done for God, there is no room for God to work and to move in our life. In fact, this is what Jesus says. Again, I'll read verse 13 and 14, the last two verses again. It says this. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And here is Jesus' response to the story. He says this in verse 14. I tell you, this one, the tax collector, went down to his house justified rather than the other. Because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Now again, in our 21st century concept and mindset, we're moved from this situation, right? We're not Jews living in Jerusalem under Roman oppression in the first century. We can read this and be like, get him, Jesus. You tell them, go tax collector. Listen, this is not the response that would have garnered Jesus' storytelling here. I mean, it's part of the reason why they kill, end up killing Jesus. It's hard for us to really understand how shocking this statement of Jesus would have been to the original hearers of this story. You see, here's the thing. Maybe to make this more real, here's what I would encourage you to do. Think of the most undeserving person that you know in your life who does not deserve the grace and mercy of God. Or maybe the people in society that all society would agree, if anyone deserves to go to hell, it's them, right? So I just, like, just to be honest here, uh, think of maybe a rapist or a serial killer or an abuser. Or maybe think of someone who stabbed you in the back and has hurt you so bad and has never, never said sorry. In fact, you see them on Facebook and their life is fine. You think, God, it is so unfair that they get to live their life after what they have done to me and I have to deal with it every single day. The worst of the worst. And God is saying, they are justified if they ask for my forgiveness and mercy. Maybe to give this maybe a more real example to you, uh, there's a story, I'll try to do this quick. There was a movie uh, uh, written or that came out in 2007 called Secret Sunshine. It's a Korean movie, and it shows us 
why the gospel is offensive. You might hear sometimes people talk about how the gospel is offensive and you're like, that doesn't make sense. That if God loves us and gives us grace, what's offensive about that? Uh, well, there's two main things. Uh, the first, it means that you actually need to be forgiven. In our culture today, like we think we're awesome. And so someone to tell us, no, you don't have it all together and you need the grace and mercy of God, that can be offensive. But it can also be offensive, especially in this context, because it means that anyone can be forgiven. Anyone. Not just most people, but anyone. And so this movie, uh, they, they, they depict how radical God's grace is and how hard it is to accept. And so what happens is it's about a woman about a movie, a movie about a woman. And uh, she marries her husband and they have a kid together. Eventually the husband uh, passes away. And so she decides to move back to her husband's hometown where he grew up. Just to try to connect uh, more with his upbringing and to learn more about him. And so after settling down, her and her son, eventually her son is murdered. He's kidnapped and then he's murdered. And so, of course, she's struggling. She's depressed. Uh, it's just like, I mean, you lost your husband. You lost your son. Like, what are you supposed to do? Uh, she eventually gets invited to church. And so she starts going to church, and she begins to hear and understand the gospel, that God loves her, that even in her suffering and her pain, her life isn't useless or her life isn't meaningless, that God can use her even in her difficulty. And she experiences the grace of God, and she gets meaning and purpose even in the midst of her unspeakable tragedy. And so she receives great God's mercy and then becomes this dramatic, climatic scene in the movie where she decides to visit her son's murderer in jail. And so she goes to the jail and what she wants to do is that she has gotten to the place where she has forgiven him and she wants to tell him that God loves him, that she loves him, and that she has forgiven him even in, even in spite of all that he has done to her and her family. And so they meet, and she starts telling them about who God is and why she has come to visit him. And as she's talking, the man starts smiling, and then he kind of interrupts her. And he starts to tell her about he too, how he too has found God and his grace in Jesus. And he says that he has been praying every single day that they would be able to meet again. And he's so excited that God has answered this prayer that they are together and that they're talking to each other. And so what happens is as he's telling her this, her face begins to change. You see, what happened was before she actually had the chance to tell him that she forgives him, she says to him, or he says to her, how amazing it is that God could forgive a sinner like him. The worst of the worst, that what he, in spite of all he has done, that God loves him, that he has already experienced the, mercy, the grace and mercy of God. And so she's upset, and she replies to the man. Again, she hasn't had the chance to forgive him yet, but he's telling her she's, that he's already been forgiven. So he, she responds by saying this, God has forgiven your sins. Right? She's like, what are you talking about? And he says, yes, and my repentance and absolution have brought me peace. And so what happens is after this encounter, this woman leaves the jail. Uh, she actually goes on to reject God. Even though she came to forgive him, the fact that she was, he was forgiven before she kind of let that happen, she goes on to reject God because she can't handle the scandal of God's grace. That God would forgive anyone, even this man, before she could. Right? She's like, this is not fair that through Jesus, God is not only able to forgive, but he actually desires it. Like he's not like sitting here and he's like, guys, if you forget, if you reach out to me, I, like he actually desires to give you grace. He's not like, well, they said, sorry, I guess I got to forgive them. But he is pursuing us and he is chasing us. And so here's what I would say when it comes to this idea of God's forgiveness and how we can be upset that God will literally forgive anyone, right? If we really think about it, we, we like this idea that he'll forgive most people, but not anyone. Here's what I would say, that if God can forgive the worst of the worst, then here's what this means, that it also means that he can forgive you. If he can forgive them, then he can also forgive you. And so what does this have to do with spiritual pride? Well, here's what I would say, that Jesus... I think he would undo spiritual pride so that the Spirit can do the work in us and through us that God actually desires. That we can actually have the room for God to move in our life. And when we think, here's the thing, when we think that we don't need help or that we can or we can do it on our own, then we have developed spiritual pride. We say to God, look at all the things that I've done for you. And so you owe me. We are no longer in a position to be used by God or maybe to put it another way. Here's what I would say the main point as we look at the spiritual pride. How can it affect us if you are a follower of Jesus? And that's this, the biggest obstacle for you to be used by God is you. The biggest obstacle for you and I to be used by God is not them, it's not your situation, it's not your financial income level, it's not your gender, it's not where you live, it is you and it is me. And here, I'm not talking about like being some like New York Times bestseller where you sell millions. I'm saying where God has placed you in your life the people that he has put around you and surrounded you with, that what God wants you to do in your life and how he wants to use you is limited to your spiritual pride. Do you and I, when we are not careful, go up before God and say, God, look at all the things that I've done, 
Or do we say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Direct me and guide me and allow me to experience more of your grace. See, here's the reality. In the kingdom of God, there is no such thing as just a stay-at-home mom. There is no such thing as just a student. There is no such thing as just here is my job and here is where I live and here is my income here. There is no just in the kingdom of God. There's no just in the kingdom of God. And when we honor God, when we love people, he actually can make a difference in our life. And so what I want to do is we have a video to share with you this morning of a couple at New City Church. If you call New City Church home, you know them and you love them. And they want to share their story, uh, especially here on Mother's Day, of the impact that God has made. And even many of you have made in their life when we decide, God, it's not about how great and not awesome about what I've done, but saying, God, how can you use me to love people around me? Let's reject spiritual pride and let's love people in our community the way God has asked. And then we hear stories like this. So take a look at the screen. I want to share a little bit. My name is Brian Androsian and this is my wife, Brittany. Uh, we're both on staff here at New City and we want to share a little bit about our um, story here on Mother's Day. Uh, we've been together, we've been married for uh, 10 years next month, 10 years in June. And uh, we're just coming up on 20 years since the first day that I asked her out. So we, we've uh, been together some t for some time. But today on Mother's Day, we want to share a little bit about our, uh, our, our story and our journey with children. One in eight women struggle with infertility. And so though it's something that we don't talk about a lot because for a lot of women, it just causes a lot of pain to talk about. I do think it's important for women to know that they're not alone in this. Um, they're not alone in their infertility journey. We've struggled with infertility all 10 years of our marriage. I think a lot of women in Christian culture identifies um, success as being a mom, um, success as being married and being a mother. And when you can't, when you're not married or you can't be a mother biologically, you feel like a failure a lot. Um, it's, uh, it, it was tough, especially in the beginning to um, talk about this and, and kind of figure out what that means for our family. In May in 2017 was our first Mother's Day here at New City Church. Um, and as I was getting to know some of the women here and talking to them about what my life was and sharing my um, story, I had a few women pray over me on Mother's Day of 2017. They brought me back in one of the kids' ministry rooms, and they just prayed a bold prayer that Mother's Day of next year, we would have a child. And so a year later, when we still didn't have a child in 2018, um, it began some harder questions between Brian and I. Um, and we had to just surrender and say, God, we're, you know, we're not going to try doing this our way anymore. And what are you leading us to? Um, that summer led us to foster care classes. We got our first placement September 1st of 2018, a little boy, 10 years old, who was an adoptive placement for us. Going into foster care was um, scary. Uh, maybe more so for me. Uh, it's kind of something that I don't know that I really let on to a lot outside of to Brittany, but it's especially going through classes and things like that, you learn about um, just what kids go through. And there's a lot of questions of like, am I, how in the world am I capable of doing anything? I mean, do, doing this, you know? We took six kids into our home um, in the past two years since we've been licensed through respite care and through full-time placements. But definitely our hardest placement was um, our full-time placement, who was an adoptive placement for us. It is very hard to struggle with infertility, have a kid come into your home, call you mom, and then leave your home. Um, it was February of 2019 when he left our home. Um, foster care is all about reunification. It's always about the best interest of the child. It's always about a permanency plan for the kid. Um, and we were not his permanency plan. Um, we love him, we pray for him daily, but it was hard to go from struggling to be a mom, to be a mom, to no longer a mom. I think Mother's Day of 2019 was my hardest Mother's Day that I ever had. Um, when I look back to Mother's Day 2019, I can see God there, I can see how he was providing, but at the time I didn't know it. Uh, Mother's Day 2019 was the first time that I met this wonderful woman at New City Church. Um, she was pregnant, she was young, and as she was sharing a little bit about her story, I remember being angry with God, angry about how it wasn't fair. This young woman who didn't plan to get pregnant is pregnant. Um, I remember driving home from church that day and just crying out, crying about it. And I didn't know that day um, that I was meeting the woman that would give birth to our son. Uh, fast forward a little bit to August 2019. Um, we were down in South Carolina and Brittany got a phone call. Um, didn't know who it was, for, I didn't know who it was from, but she was talking to this person and, uh, for, gosh, maybe 45 minutes, for a long time. And she was just weeping and she hung up and, and I was like, what's, what's going on, is everything okay? 
And she said, I, I just got a call from a friend of ours who says that she knows someone who wants to talk to you about potentially adopting her son. And that's all, that's, that's all we knew at the time. Like we didn't have much information. Um, come to find out he was gonna be born in a month. Yeah, we got our call on Thursday. Um, we set up a meeting to meet her that Saturday um, with our f mutual friend here. Um, we met at New City Church with mm -hmm. her um, and talked. And that Saturday, she made the decision to place her child for adoption with me and Brian. Yeah, so it was it was a whirlwind from there. Adoption is expensive. Adoption is expensive. Um, even doing open adoption, it is still it was twenty five thousand dollars that we were looking to raise within one month. Yep. Um, looking at that, and just we didn't want to get our hopes up. Point four, um, we kind of just prayed and said, "God, if this is where you're leading, then we believe you're going to provide for this." Yeah, it was scary. Like it was tough to look at it and be like, "How is this even going to happen?" But there's no way to explain how it all came together outside of God. Like it was, it was a, in large part people right here at New City that just rallied around and showed up. Yeah, so after all the fundraising, after all the praying, um, Theodore was born on September 17th, 2019. So we were waiting and just, there's a lot of just sitting in the hospital room waiting to find out, uh, you know, how the birth went and what happened. Then all of a sudden the door opened and they just wheeled him in. It's, it's hard to put to words what, what, what it was like right then of yeah. a month and a half ago, having no idea that this baby it existed, you know, not knowing anything about this. And then all of a sudden this child's being wheeled in and they're saying, this is your mom and dad one of the very first people that I told about Theodore. Um, they were my mentor in foster care and they asked me what we were going to name him. Um, so when I told her the name, she just started crying. She started showing me text messages of her reaching out to her small group and her tribe um, that God placed the name Theodore on her heart on Mother's Day. Um, and so she had been praying for this Theodore baby for a long time, thinking that he was gonna come into her home. Um, but. I was just so grateful for the way that God saw my heartbreak on Mother's Day and reached out and had other people praying for me the entire time and for our son. Mother's Day can be a hard day for many women and for many different reasons. Maybe you're struggling with infertility, loss of a child, loss of a mother, um, whatever it is. I think it's important to know two things. One, you're not alone. Um, people love you and most importantly God loves you and so if you've never heard that before you are loved you are not alone um, and two I just think it's very important to fill yourself up with foundational truths because if this day is going to be hard for you that's okay let it be hard um, you can cry you can grieve you can do whatever you need to do on that day but don't sit in that pain our faith in Jesus does not come for what he does for us but it comes in the character of who he is and I think that when we know the character of God, we know how much he loves us, um, it makes those hard moments a little bit easier. When we know that we're deeply loved and we know that with his grace and with his love, um, we're gonna be healed eternally and we're going to have no pain one day. Our, our worth with God didn't change because we had Theodore. Um, you know, we didn't become mom and dad and then all of a sudden now we're what it looks like to be a Christian couple. Because there are people that struggle with infertility that are never, that may never have kids, that may never pursue adoption. And that I think it's important to remember that your worth isn't dependent on children. And that it's not a matter of if you, if you can't have kids, then you need to figure out a different way to have kids. You matter to God regardless of your status as parents or husband, wife. May is National Foster Care Month. Um, and I think that just ties right along with what you were saying. You don't have to do everything. You may not even be called to be a foster parent. You may not even be called to be a mother, um, but I believe that we all can do something little and we all can help change lives. Um, everyone here at New City Church that prayed for us, that supported us, that knew our story, that loved us, helped change our life. And we are incredibly thankful for that. That's just a great reminder um, that the biggest obstacle to God using us is often us. Um, it's not to say that if you're really faithful, life will turn out the way that you want. But here you have a couple, didn't have a lot of money, uh, been through a lot of pain, a lot of heartache, and say, God, what would you have us do uh, with where you placed us? Um, and God is using them in powerful ways. And God wants to use you and I in powerful ways. So when we go before the Lord, it's not about saying, look at what I've done, look at what I've given, look at how, who I've helped. It's saying, God, have mercy on me 
a sinner and allow me to follow your grace and who you are. Last thing I'll read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, Jesus is talking about how believers are meant to be salt and light, make a difference in the world. And he says this, in the same way, those of us that are followers of Jesus, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Not that they may hear your prayers about how great you are, but they, they, may, they might see a life transformed by Jesus, that we love in a way that's weird, that we forgive in a way that doesn't make sense, that we give grace in a way that is undeserved because we've experienced the grace and mercy of God. And if you're here today and you do not yet know that, know that mercy that God gives you, today's the perfect opportunity that God wants to welcome you into his family, that he loves you where you are and he wants to change you, but he first wants you to experience his grace. Uh, and so what we're going to do before we sing one more song of worship together, we're going to enter into a time of confession. Um, that we do this every week. Uh, we go before God privately to confess our sins before him. Um, why, why do we do this? Because we're all broken and it allows us to simply to be honest, right? What confession is, is us being honest before God. And here's what we know, that scripture tells us that God always gives grace and mercy to those who ask for it. Always. That text collector, that drug smuggler, that prostitute that does not deserve in our mind the grace and mercy of God walks away justified, not because of what they have done, because of what Christ has done for us. And so would you take a second, uh, pray privately before God about the areas where you might have been prideful, the areas where you say, God, look at what I have done for you, instead of thanking him for what he has done for me. Would you ask God to have mercy on you and me, a sinner? And then I'll close this in prayer. So would you go before God?